Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, here we are. We are officially the Greta Garbo <laughs> of podcasts. <laughs> I, I want to be alone. <laughs> we are um, in Italy. We are in Italy now. We're almost, almost at the very end of our tour, of this very, very long tour. And <laughs> I'm sure if you're on uh, social media, you've seen that I had a little bit of a health challenge. And uh, so far, so good. You know, I'm getting, I'm getting slightly better. But uh, it's, I think it's exhaustion in the end of the day, you know. Um, and um, You're still going to Germany. I still go to Germany. And, and Slovenia. Uh, Slovenia. I go to Poland now. To Warsaw. To Warsaw. In a very nice hotel. In Constantine. I'm jealous. Constantine. And uh, you're going to finish there. I am with Sarah Zagrak. Right. Yeah. So um, that's our last chances in Europe, basically. Yes. Um, but um, first of all, you know, guys, um, health comes before everything. That's definitely my lesson on this tour. And um, I have to scale back a little bit. I have yeah. to be just as honest because this is, you know, been a very, very long tour for us, for me especially. And I just realized that it took a toll on me because of Japan. It was so long. Japan was a, a long. Uh, the flights were long, and, and we added London because we had to go to Japan. Right. So there was a lot of uh, shifting and changing, and then it was boom, 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 and uh, yeah, it hit me. It got me. So. Uh, I'm now in the elusive club of burnout victims. <laughs> um, have a drink on me. Uh, anyway, but we are finishing here in wonderful Umbria. If you don't know, Umbria is for, um, you know, Beautiful. usually the tourists will all go to Toscana and pay the overpriced um, prices that they have. But Umbria is a really, really beautiful place right below. And this is a place called Ichi Kamini, to which we are... How many years are we coming here? Uh, almost 15. Almost 15 years. Uh, it's a beautiful place. Beautiful. The people are just stunning, the way they take care of us. And um, it is a little oasis in the middle of the Tuscan forest, basically. Mm -hmm. you know. So it's quite lovely. And we had um, a uh, week-long training here with an absolutely fantastic group of people. And we were wondering about uh, the subject for this podcast. And I think it is about, should maybe talk about the feminine yes. and the matriarchy and what's the, coming and the time of the matriarchy, because I think that it's really, really crucial that first of all, that you know who you are. And second, that you tell your story, because if you let anyone else define what you should be, how you should be, and how you should tell a story, or let somebody else tell your story, you're, you know, you're going to feel lost, basically. Right? So, um, Foster, of course, you're, you're a great supporter of women for, uh, throughout your career. I mean, it's all about women empowerment, basically. And a storyteller. And a storyteller, of course, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but it's very interesting at the moment to see where the feminine empowerment movement goes. It's quite interesting from a political point, of course, throughout the world, from an economic point, we see more and more female voices really rising up and giving an, in, an insight into how society really functions or is dysfunctioning rather. And um, women, I think, are always the first to observe it. You know, they're always at the forefront because from women are expected to make the children, to uh, raise them, to have the home, to have a job, to fulfill the husband or, the, you know, the partner, to uh, be present in the community. There's a lot on the plate. And I think a lot of women say, you know, we have to change the rules. I always remember Michael Harner uh, was in a cave and he was doing a very traditional shamanic initiation where you sit in darkness in a cave and uh, the animals come, you know, like a stampede. You don't physically see them, you just hear them. And then after the animals, he's, he wrote something that's very fascinating to me, because I went through this initiation in a cave. Um, a woman came, and it was Lilith. And he, in the patriarchal mindset of Michael Harner and the people that came before, many shamans that came before, very masculine, they saw her as a temptation. They saw her as something that comes in a cave, which is traditionally where you would mm -hmm. meet Lilith. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, she comes because, in a way, you're invoking her by waiting there, by doing the 
the invocations that mm. he did, even though they're shamanic. And he saw it as something negative, that you talk to Lilith, that she tries to seduce you as a woman. And that's a very patriarchal, old oh, yeah. male way of thinking of her. Oh, yeah. And I think we have to now release all of that stuff. Mm. It's from a different time period where people didn't understand Lilith. Mm -hmm. So I think we all have to understand her. In this training we just did, you did a ritual of Lilith. Mm -hmm. You're, you know, we were invoking her. And she comes, very fierce. Very fierce. There's nothing gentle about her. No. And she did a lot of healing work on people. Yes. And she blessed them. And Now Lilith, of course, was the first wife of Adam. Right. And in many of the texts, many things we know about Lilith, though there's very little written that's truth. Right. Um, and you talk often about this Jewish text. Yes, the Ben Shirach. In which they're talking about Lilith as a woman who is the first... Well, they talk about the snake as life a woman. hero. Yes. They really turn it on their head, the whole story. And they, st and they are people who believe that Lilith or the snake... In the, Garden of Eden. Um, in the Garden of Eden, is the hero who came to liberate uh, Adam and Eve from their unconsciousness. I have to say, you know, I read many variations. There are 28 versions of the Bible, I think, so far. Um, you know, every couple of popes, something will be changed and mm -hmm. something will be re-interpreted, interpreted, basically, you see. Um, but very few parts of the Bible really... The problem with the Bible and every sacred text, by the way, or, or doctrine text, is that they are filled with contradictions. Two pages is one thing, the other page is the opposite. And this tells you that how many people just added their... Two cents. ...ideas, their two cents to it, without any kind of uh, research in that sense, we would say. And also today, very little research is being made... But uh, it's getting better and better, I From say. a very old mindset or a patriarchal mm. mindset. Right, you see. Because the thing is that Lilith is the one who basically disobeys. So she's not only the first woman in creation, but she's the first fully aware of her power. Woman. Feminine. And, um, it, of course, Adam has a scuffle with her. And she, he says, you know, obey to me. And she says, absolutely not. So he goes like a snitch and talks to Yahweh. Okay, I still think it's amazing to me and funny that white Catholics worship a third-class Sumerian deity. It's amazing to me. Not even the <laughs> big honcho. They just went for third class. But here we are in that story with Yahweh, who basically says to her, do what Adam says. And she says, absolutely not. So she represents a very important, intricate part of evolution, which is I'm not just going to take something because it's being said as, um, as a rule. And she's a rule breaker. So she breaks the rule and she says, I'm not going to um, surrender here to any kind of limited role. And quite frankly, Adam is not good enough for me. See, um, she has children with the guy, by the way. I think they have three or four children. And I believe also when I read and try to make sense of it, is that she at some point says to Yahweh, um, you made me at the same time, from the same fabric, at the same moment, with the same breath, I'm equal to him. Because if you had a different intention, you would have made him first and after than me, but you made us both at the same time, so from the same fabric, so I'm equal, I'm not obeying to anyone. And basically he kicks her out. Or more accurately, she says, you know, screw you, I'm out of here, because I don't need this kind of oppressive, um, patriarchal view. You know, and that's, that's not concept. our projection onto the story. Absolutely that's the not. real story. So the first woman decides that, first of all, her husband's not good enough for her. Right. Second of all, that she will follow herself. Right. She won't follow the false god, or right. Yahweh, who, as you know in the Bible, is quite violent. Well, she op and very oppressive. Oppressive and vengeful. And vengeful Every and very narcissistic. He destroys something, yeah. And extremely narcissistic. Right. That's not a god. Those are right. human attributes of a minor god. Right. You know. The real supreme, El Elyon, or the real... Eloa. Eloa. El Eloa. Is completely different. Right. In the story of Melchizedek, of course, Abraham goes with his Yahweh and says to Melchizedek, worship my God. And Melchizedek says, 
I'm really not interested, but I'll give you the blessing of the great supreme to which I obey, and that's it. So there is an older um, understanding of the divine way before Abraham shows up and, you know, does his shtick, basically, and, and how, convinces everyone. How is that related to the oversoul? Well, we all are oversouls. Yes. We all have an oversoul, and the oversoul extends her power, her will, of us in multiple variations, in multiple dimensions. We coexist all at the same time. See? And so, I, I try to explain to people that what we call past lives, you know, my ability to see a past life, if it were really past, I would not be able to see it. I can only see what's there, what's in this moment. But the term past life, for example, in this context, um, it means that if we look at it from a point of that everything is, time doesn't exist, and everything exists at the same time, but the same simultaneously, it means that your past lives are all active while you are here. And the reason why I can see it is because it is simultaneously. It's like I'm watching TV in, in your in your living room, and I'm watching you in your living room, so to speak. Yes. But in this context of Lilith, you know, she is a multidimensional being. She's fully aware of herself. In witchcraft, of course, let's say that um, she's not only the first woman in creation, but the first witch. And a witch is really a empowered woman, you know. They're using this, I don't want to say it's a derogatory term, but, you know, it can be... It means wise woman. It means wise woman, really. Uh, and so she is uh, fully immersed in her power. And by the time she leaves, she also leaves with a bunch of angels. They're called the fallen. But they're not fallen. A, a, the Nephilim. The Nephilim. But a great deal of these intelligences, I don't use the term angels, but intelligence said, you know, we, we agree with Lilith. This is not right. This is so against everything that a god should represent. Yeah. And um, we want to go down with her and um, formulate a different experience or contribute to a different experience that humans will have now that Yahweh is so pissed off about everybody, you know, throws everyone out. That, <laughs> you know, that now we have in Genesis 2, by the way, a second time, the first woman in creation, that we call her Eve. For me, and I don't know why I make this connection, is... I wouldn't be surprised if Eve is the daughter of Lilith, you know, because Lilith returns to the garden as the snake, okay? Again, here starts, snake. here begins yeah. the misogyny, right? Yeah. And through the rest of the 10,000 pages, it's all misogynistic. I don't know how women can follow this indoctrinated, misogynistic religion. I, I really... It well, we see the byproduct of it, well, like in politics, in all sorts of women that are in control now. Absolutely. I mean, we are in Italy where they have a female president, I think the, for the first time. Yes. And she happens to be a fascist. I mean, conservative. 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 Many conservative. Yes, conservative. Who follow They're patriarchy. They're fascists. They're That's women who follow okay. patriarchy. That's what it is. The first thing they do is create abortion. Abortion. You know, it's bad. Right, exactly. That's the first thing they do. Right. So, it's interesting that we have an evolution of women who basically are just spokespeople for the patriarchy. Mm. There's no... Um, they there's disempower no, women. It, there's no identity. In they, their idea of a strong woman is a disempowered woman. Who is so, religious. And here we have Eve. Right. Here we have Eve, who is under a spell. Adam too, of course, because he's another idiot. So they're both running around butt naked in the garden. <laughs> and here comes the snake. Here comes Lilith and says, you better eat from that tree and wake the F up because you are being um, manipulated. Eat and from the tree of knowledge. Eat from the tree of knowledge. The knowledge gives them the ability to see the truth. And of course, Adam and Eve realize this is not a real place. This is Disneyland <laughs> behind the Behind the wall, facade. behind the facade, so. there is, you know, a lot of crap happening. So they so leave voluntarily. They leave voluntarily. They are not being chased out. They're not they being, wake up. Because they say, this, this, this is fake. Let's go and see what the real world is about. And the real world, it sounds very Matrix, but, you know, the Wachowski sisters really got it right in that sense of interpretation. And, of course, 
um, the matrix yeah. they leave and realize that we are this is um, the real world or this is the dimension in which we are supposed to be not just hang around butt naked with animals everywhere and you know be a boy that you eat from the wrong tree of course in the story also Yahweh is so angry that they ate because now they realize he's not real or he's not a real God. They're empowered. Because, they see. Because it says in the Bible, you know, it says they um, they can hear his footsteps in the garden and he screams around, where are you, where are you? Uh, if you were God, you would know I'm in the bushes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> hiding in the bushes but naked. And they hear his footsteps, uh, what God has footsteps. So, again, in a very <laughs> simplified version, of course, this is not academic by all means, but in, in, a, in a spiritual understanding, it's the Bible is at the beginning a lot about waking up to your true self. Yeah. You know, I don't know if this was intentionally done, but that is the effect. It's a lot about wake up to your true self and realize what there is. Because it starts with if you disobey God, then this will happen to you. And these people or these personas say, I'm leaving. I'm out anyway. No problem. I'm leaving. And they create their own identity. Yeah. And um, they leave the garden. They leave the garden, which is just a facade. And so throughout history, we see very often the demonization of women. Now, in the witchcraft time, of course, it's always a woman who has nothing else to do than become an, a spectral, astral <laughs> invader who goes to the usually the ugliest guy in the village and has sex with him. And then he runs around accusing her of stuff. You know, I mean, it's, it's fascinating what people got away with in these times. But so much so was the misogyny integrated and imprinted in society. It's really not much different than what we see that happens in Islam, Islamic countries about the feminine. You know, a good woman is a quiet woman, basically. Right? Obedient. Obedient. And if they speak up, they're being murdered. We have so many examples of what if they could in drive or if they take off the garments. So. That's the idea. So um, it is a fascinating idea. And also from our experience, I can only speak for myself, of course, is how even with all these reasoning, how difficult it is sometimes to motivate a woman to become her own person. You know, because they want that freedom. They want that independence. That doesn't mean leave your families and children and, you know, you know, not necessarily. become a, um, you know, become a um, selling t-shirts in the Bahamas or something and find themselves. It's not what we mean. <laughs> you know, it is really to understand that they are their own reality, their own persona, their own uh, enforced power, basically. And so I always go back to uh, many different scriptures that really understood that the story is being told backwards. You know, and even the Cathars, um, you know, there's the University the of French Google. Cathars. There's the University of Google, which you should look up. Um, the Cathars was a French um, religious group. Alternative to the Catholics. Alternative, who told the, the church, we know that you worship the devil. The false god. The false god. And they would be really what we would call a... Um, Many Gnostics believe the same. The same idea, absolutely. So you can definitely, you can do research, you can find a lot of similarity in this view. But it is interesting because we, we see that Pluto these days, uh, in the form of Persephone, becomes the fury of the feminine. And the fury of the feminine Persephone is, that's her name, by the way. Persephone means the female destroyer. Her father is Perses, the destroyer. So she's the female destroyer. And she's married to Hades, the god of the underworld. Absolutely, yes. She's an underworld destroyer. Right. And, but again... She could destroy this world. But she, again, she's described as the poor thing that got raped and dragged into never, the underworld never. and yells for her mother. Right. But look at her name. Her name itself doesn't indicate anything gentle or victimized or anything like this. Right? Yes. That's the idea. You understand? So... It is really important here, and I was telling um, also the story of Cleopatra today. Um, Cleopatra, the, the Cleopatra, right, that we all see, uh, know only as Liz Taylor, white people playing, you know, 
but now we have also the black washing of historic figures. You know, next time we have uh, we have um, Chris Hemsworth playing Obama. You know, this is how far we go now in entertainment. Complete nonsense. Um, we have a black actress. I'm sure she's great. Um, who plays a historic figure, which is white. She's Greek. Um, she's not Nubian. She's not Nubian. I mean, I know, you know, uh, black people would love to make everything black now, but it's not. It's just not. Okay? But the same thing happened. Um, we have Charlton Heston, the epitome of Moses. I mean, the guy is like blonde with blue eyes and white skin. <laughs> Are you freaking kidding me? You know? It's not Middle East. But no. It's not Middle East, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, this is the idea. This is the idea. And, and Joseph sure also wasn't one person. It was a group. It was a group. So it's, again, you know... I don't think I'm going to live long enough to even comprehend all the dots that I'm putting together so far already um, of how much manipulation is happening there. And the manipulation is always out for the repression and the control of masses. They can't be trusted. Therefore, they have to be controlled. Especially the women. Especially women. Women have power. Women have a connection to spirit. Absolutely. The oversoul. Women are connected to spirit because women give birth. We or they're capable of this miracle and because of that, the female is always connected stronger to her oversoul than the male part. And then you were talking about baptism. What happens to a baby in baptism? A baptism is basically a, and I've, and I've watched this, is basically a shutting down of the third eye. And interesting enough, when babies scream, thankfully they scream all the time, but the screaming interrupts. During a baptism. During a baptism, it interrupts the closing of the third eye. That's you know, a good thing. You want your baby to scream the whole time they're being baptized. You know, if you're really into that kind of religion and doctrine, you will see that um, there's all, this text is very much about gain, sin, guilt, shame, um, uh, be a good uh, Christian, uh, you know, not a good person, be a good Christian, and that will make you, you know, no. that justifies, you know, everything. that's why everybody, you know, messes up their life, and then they go to church, they become born again, and then everything is done from before. I'm sorry, that doesn't work. That's not how it works. You know, if you've been a bad person before, changing religion will not make you suddenly <laughs> a, a saint. You know, um, and this is also what, what I don't like is when people, especially in the religious uh, communities, you know, they're talking from this, finally they reached, they, they found something that really works for them. And instead of enjoying that point, now they're judging everybody who doesn't do it their way. I mean, you missed the point. You missed the point. But that is, again... Um, you said the same thing about the power of now. I don't, judgmental even, I, I don't even want to go in there. I have that's to say, simple. I met enough people that you would, and I'm not going to say names because that's unimportant, who really represent a certain um, uh, philosophy or an interesting philosophy even, uh, a very uh, empowering philosophy. And when you meet these people, it's the most disappointing thing you can imagine. The judgment <laughs> that goes on, the, the trashing, the gossiping, the talking behind their backs. And I thought, what's happening here? Mm. You see? So in my 20 years in LA, I met pretty much everybody. You knew a lot more important people that, uh, than me in your life. Mm. And I have to say, I got a little disillusioned. You know, I met great yoga masters and yoga teachers who basically, um, I asked them about their practice and they said, I don't need to make yoga anymore. I am yoga. And I thought, what an idiot. <laughs> you know, I mean, what an idiot. And then I knew, time to move on, you see. So, but the idea is that these early stories of what makes a good person good, you know, is literally especially in the feminine aspect, mm -hmm. always about be quiet, be obedient, do your job, support your man, and we're in a good place. Hopefully that's it. You know? no. And what the reason, it has to end, uh, mm -hmm. it has to change because change is always around the corner. And that, I think, is what, um, why the trans community and the gay community and the, the LGBTQ plus I uh, communities are getting the the brunt of the of the of the um, conservatives is because who who I can't tell a woman who was a man who now identifies as they them 
to be quiet and sit in the back. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I asked my guide so often, what is this whole subject about? And my guide said that when a soul decides to shift an experience of gender identity, a penis is a penis, a vagina is a vagina, let's not kid ourselves, there's two genders, but the identity, <coughs> excuse me, how you identify is a completely different story. And men, chromosome men, who identify as women, become a, should become, I want to say, a great spokesperson for true femininity. It's basically where women have broken out of their oppression. Trans men will do it because trans men have, um, or trans women have one benefit. They remember the lives of men. And they say, I'm not going to be told what to do because I used to be a man. And now I identify as my true self. And that true self is the spirit of the feminine. And we have a lot more genders. Mm. Trust me, it's as confusing to you as it is to me. And I don't have to understand it. And I don't even have to tune into it because, it, you know, at this point I have enough on my plate. Uh, then understanding what uh, makes you uh, not and what it does. But... The last thing I will do is um, judge it. Mm. Who am I to judge somebody how they feel? And what is the evolution then of the hermaphrodite? Was there an original 144,000 hermaphrodites? Well, that's that's what certain scriptures also describe, that there was a, um, um, a tribe, we want to call it, of people who had both abilities, both genders, and also to some degree, and that's, again, I can't prove this, but it was mentioned that some of them were, had the ability to impregnate themselves. Right. And that was, of course... The holy birth. The holy birth idea. So there, are these, there are these texts and there are these depictions. And, you know, mm. people who wrote about it, either they saw it or they heard it mm. in their lifetime. But, um, again, there is a lot more identity possible than just a penis and a... <laughs> and a you know, it's just more than that. So I do believe that... We are what we are. We're born the way we're born. And sorry, chromosomes are chromosomes. Yeah. But identifying is a complete different story because identity has to do with truth. And Pluto now, I mean, in my 55 years, I don't remember ever being bombarded by trans issues as much as the last couple of years. And I thought, what is happening? Suddenly everybody's trans. I mean, what's going on here? Or everybody has a... It's, it's an, an explosion. explosion because Pluto is ending the patriarchal cycle of thousand years and is beginning a, f a matriarchal cycle. Because it's done a full revolution. A full revolution. And now we are exactly at the shifting point, whatever Pluto comes from the underworld and Persephone as well. So whatever was repressed now comes to the surface. Explodes to the surface. And that's why... For 20 years. For 20 well, years... Pluto's in Aquarius. It, right. It will change our society. So, like, you know gay aspects or um, LGBT aspects. Look, in the Western um, educated world, it's not a big deal anymore. You know, we have a gay marriage for over 10 years now, so the people who think uh, what is happening, they didn't get the memo. It's already done. It's happened already. Yeah. But many people are afraid of these new souls. They're not afraid of what we call the third wave. Right. All these kids being born who don't Absolutely. believe anymore in these conservative ideas. Absolutely. That's they, exactly They don't what's follow happening. anyone Any and they don't rule. follow rules. Right. You see, our parents were the first wave. So they got the shit, basically. You know, they got the world wars and the pestilences and the, I don't and know what they else. They received a lot. No, they received the wars a lot. were enough. The wars were enough, and but then, beginning. you know, the rest. Then came the transition of the came, second wave. We are in the we second the, wave. We are the second wave. And the many people in that. We prepared the transition, a shift. We're shifting generations. The 60s, the 70s, right. the 80s. And now since, let's say, for the 2000s, I would say, we are um, in the third wave. And that's a generation which will absolutely not follow any rules. No. They will create their own rules, their own society. It's nice when I look at Gen Zers at the moment, and I'm really impressed how smart they are, how well educated they are. They really know what they're talking about, and I see them especially in politics. And I think they're going to be the big changers of our societies, so that our generation, That's what we I would for. say between 50 and 65, is the active second wave now. 
we can step back a little bit. Mm. We can say, let them do it. Now it's their turn we to feel. really bring it home, so to speak. And for the next 20 years, we're going to see with Pluto a great shift in matriarchal. Um, but so many Generation Z people are now coming to us because they're looking for what exactly happened here. How did you screw up this planet? Or right. how did you, right. what happened historically? So we start to tell them. Right. And that empowers them and they start to understand. But what is also interesting, we had a young man here. How old is he? 20 something, yes. right? In his meditation, we didn't even mention anything. He had an experience with a Nephilim. Where the hell does he understand the word Nephilim? So here we go, you see? And the Nephilim created, of course, made it with females and created a demigod race, race yes. a semi, uh, you know, which we call, or I call, a spiritual race now. Children of the Nephilim. The children of the Nephilim. And there are quite a few of them, and those are, tend to be spiritual people. Right. That's why some people right. are not spiritual. Right. They don't have that blood, and some yeah. are. Yeah. Even though it's been intermarried and everything, doesn't matter. You still have to wake up the Nephilim blood. Right. But some people certainly have it stronger. Yeah. We have it very strong, for sure. Absolutely. But it you takes know. a while to navigate this world, to figure it out. Right. You know. Because it's just one dimension of a world. Yes. And as we change ourselves, we change into different dimensional realities. And you're not reality. changing the world, really. We're changing ourselves. And your teacher came between 10 and 15, mm. and you learned everything. And right. that was the awakening. Right. And for me, you know, only when I turned really 14, 15, mm -hmm. did I start to really... Awaken Realize, yeah, but the and word, say no. But to a lot of things happened taught. before already. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, it's quite fascinating. I think. It's, therefore, because I was raised very Christian. Yes. And so, by fifteen, after reading yeah. all the Bibles and everything, I suddenly had a, a revelation. Yeah. That's not it. And I left. Right. But you see, that's why I think being different in general helps us to question um, rules that are being generalized. That's what different different people do. They see life different, they act different, they don't want to obey to it. You know, so it's good to have a different take on life because it is also an opposition to, you know, for everybody looking the same, doing the same, and living the same, basically. You know, the one the reason why I live I, I love despite love living in America is that Americans always are um always looking for the evolution in the end. They, I mean, they're not immune to resistance, who is, but in the end, change happens there faster, quicker, and more intense. And even when I look at the political fights at the moment about, you know, uh, you know let's call them Republicans and uh, Democrats and so on, um, as, as more than anything, it's a question of intelligent and educated or not in the end. And when somebody responds only through fear, because the change scares me, it's not going to well, it's, it's go very far. Nobody wants to pay no, high taxes, certainly. Well, but, you know, we don't really. No. We want to pay, you know, right. what is important for people, but what they need. Life has to be more than just taxes. It has to be how we choose to respond by human rules. And human rules is we have to imply and be more kind. We have to be more kind and more understanding for people. Getting, really older, generous, yeah. getting older for me definitely helps me at the moment to be much more gentle with people that usually I would have no big patience for unless they're really stupid and just don't know when to shut up. Um, <laughs> then, you know, then uh, I'm sorry, but I don't have enough time on this planet to deal with this. But um, it's interesting to see how people in their own way try step by step. But it is, again, we have to always consider, male and female, how difficult it is to break out of a centuries and decades long um, doctrine and suddenly to have it, you know, put upside down, basically. Yes. But of course, also, we let's be clear, people who um, are so aggressive against, um, for example, LGBT at the moment, or abortion. Or abortion or anything. Um, they have their own um, little skeleton in their own closets. There is, And there are so many examples now of people who become, uh, you know, they're being filmed. They're on Twitter, they're on TikTok. Um, being exposed. Being exposed in, uh, against Sexual women. Sexual fidelities, all sorts but of things. 
and not one drag queen in, among them. No. They're all priests and coaches and <laughs> teachers and uh, uncles and fathers, you know. No drag queens, funny enough. And gay parenting is quite a profound thing. Absolutely. We know many very kind, well, very generous gay parents absolutely. who do certainly don't groom children. Well, That's absurd. Gay parenting, for example, is a third wave concept. Yes. So people are having a backlash against mm -hmm. all these new souls coming in, mm -hmm. all these new ideas that have been perpetuated. Yeah. And the fact is they've actually lost the fight already. I th yes. They, so they want they, to have control. They don't, they, have, they don't get it. It's too late. What you worry about happened already 20, 30 years ago, you know. Uh, but I think that uh, Lilith at the moment has a field day. Yeah. She must look at the world and say, that's my kids. You know, go show them. Go do it. She's, uh, I'm sure she's very proud at the moment uh, of how different thinkers, uh, I don't like the word alternative, but different thinkers really put everything upside down and question the status quo, you know, which gives us all a chance of evolution. In 20 years, we're going to look back at all this and think what the hell was wrong with these people. Because Hungary yeah. seems very backward. Poland has a lot of backward politicians. Absolutely. People are trying to change. Right. Uganda, a lot of Africa, incredibly backwards. Right. And, and we now have to face that, that there's right. a great deal of people who right. don't want change. Right. Who are resistant and they're very fearful right. of what's coming. Aggression is always coming out of fear. It's coming all out of fear, but also it's coming of a lack of education. Mm. Okay, the people who who go and um, threaten drag queens basically at mm. their own shows are people who haven't finished high school <laughs> or bad. finished the Bible, by the way. You know, because when they argue with me, they can't even quote what I'm telling them. But um, it's fascinating. It's really fascinating. I think it is a result of being cultured and educated and by media and a certain kind of media over and over right. again indoctrinated right to to right. to protest something right that is absurd actually right. you know and in the time of the archangels and lilith and eve and adam they had their own mind there was a twitter to go and rant about <laughs> they had to figure things out once they woke up and isn't it interesting that the slogan of this um whole campaign in the u.s is being woke and what that I still don't know what exactly that rep refers to, but um, an awakened mind. An awakened. So mind. you're against an awakened it, mind, which is an amazing statement to make. Right. It's about absolute manipulation and oppression Actually, of anybody who's awake. Right. How fascinating. Absolutely. In terms of Lilith. So, the the take that I had from the last days in in the work in the workshop, is that ultimately we have to make the changes within. Because the outer changes will not change anything. No. We will not change this world. No one changes the world. We change the world within us. And by that, we m maneuver ourselves into an experience. I always say I'm, we go into a different dimension where these aspects are just non-aspects. Mm. They're not part of it because you don't resonate in that level. That's why I'm looking at it. I'm reading about it. But I try as much as I can not to be part of it because mm. I don't want to be stuck in this dimension with all these people, you know, <laughs> playing out their nonsense. I want to stay in my own dimension and I want to ask for the best and highest well, or deepest dimension for healing, and, for clarity, right. for... Right. And then you know, what's the idea why we did this In training? the morning when you wake up. Yeah. And that's how I said the last days to our group. Who are you? Because mm. the universe will give you what you are, not what you want. No. So you have to really come to terms with who you are. What is your story? I had this wonderful uh, little um, example about Cleopatra that, um, you know... Let's tell them. Uh, tell them about I totally, we totally got off, but that's a specialty of us to go the long road. Uh, bear with us. Um, we're a mess, you know. We're really no, a it's mess. it's storytelling. Yes. Okay, it's storytelling time. But um, Cleopatra... <laughs> uh, came to the throne at 17, dies at 39, speaks more than nine languages, is versed in diplomacy. She is a very, very educated person. Even for that unheard time, that was unheard of, right? And to depict a woman like this as some sex maniac who had nothing else to do than fall in love with the wrong people and, uh, you know, get her ass bit by a snake, basically, 
That is misogyny. Like the misogynistic you know, on a, on a, look, look at you know, Catherine the Great. They're so fascinated by her. Catherine the Great was quite a wonderful person, by the way, mm. in the fact that she created the first school for girls. Right. And we'll never forget that. Right. That's number one on our list. She did not, you know, have sex with a horse. Yeah. That is something that was created as a gossip against her to right. demean her. Again, well, how they create gossip in history in order to defame a woman. That's a kind of demonization. Absolutely. That's more modern. No. But Cleopatra has left... Um, some writings, there are some physicians who wrote about how they studied her writings about healing, about cosmetics, about alchemy, about her philosophic take, for example. So we know these scriptures existed because people wrote about that. Yes. And um, th it's exactly how we know that female rabbis existed before because their sons wrote about their mothers being rabbis. So, I mean, unless they're making it up, but that's the idea. Because the rabbi mm. who taught Christus, mm. the, f the most important thing he said to her, even though you're an excellent rabbi, your main problem is, you know, first of all, you're not Jewish. And second of all, don't teach women. Yeah. That was the edict. Yeah. Don't teach that women. Was the end the, it was the end of my studies. Ridiculous. You know? Unfortunately, you're not Jewish. And worse, I'm not even circumcised. Now I am. Too much information. But then I was a kid. I didn't even know what he means until he whipped it out in front of me and said, do you still have that? Okay. Today he would be in jail. Then it was totally normal, by the way, to act around children like this. You were 10. I was 10. Okay. Today you would be on uh, Oprah probably. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and I would get a million dollar settlement. But um, that was his thing, you know. And don't don't uh, empower to a woman because you know they don't know how to handle this material. How is patriarchy though connected to something like you know the sexual abuse of boys or the, of girls and this kind of sexual abuse by you know the priest sexually abused you too when you were young? Well, how is that? Is, I think it's very symptomatic that especially sexual abuse happens predominantly from men. Yes. It well, happens like, predominantly from men, and it's predominantly men who are invisible. We would invisible men are men who are so well um, embedded in the society. We would never assume that stuff. It's like, like the, the ex murderer, like the now, mayor with his daughter, like you, right? With the priest. In the, in the end of the day, in the end of the day, um, if we look at people who are being exposed now, I mean, they catch them left and right. Basically, there is a <coughs> Excuse me. A great amount of people in uh, ministries, in schools, in in um, as coaches, in governments, <laughs> and in, in many positions of, of power. We just had a big uh, scandal. Not a child, but uh, on British TV, right? Where I think it went a little overboard. The idea there were two consensual adults having an affair. He was married, but... You know, who cares? You know, everybody knew what's going on. But, um, again, um, in my time, you know, and I'm 55, so I want to say between the ages, you know, five, I would say, uh, you know, but five and about 12. I, you know, we were exposed to a lot of things today would be absolutely taboo. Yeah. It was completely normal to be exposed to certain sexual acts sometimes, even under the guise of funny. And very often, talking about the feminine, let's stay with the feminine, women not stepping in. They, they would just not step in, you know. I remember my mother being there and said, well, you know, that's what they do, you know, because it, it was like a festivity. And this man dances and then in his trance rubs his lower parts on me in front of the whole restaurant. And I what thought, is what is going on here? You know, but everybody thought it's funny. Trust me, today everybody would be in jail for 20 years, <laughs> you know, but this is how times have changed. But it was funny that no woman would come forth and say, stop this right here. You know, something is really not right here. And I still see it. I still see it. I see how women are being paralyzed to speak up yeah. when abuse happens in their own homes, when they're watching it, when they're living it, when they're justifying, which is the worst. You know, how a woman who is a mother 
and then, for example, says to her son or daughter, you're gay, you're out of my life. You know, I'm telling you, you don't deserve the air you breathe. It's beyond me. I raised three children in my family, you know, my, my nephews and my niece. And uh, um, I, I was there when they, you know, I can't even imagine yes. sending them away. No matter what they would do, you stand for family. And these are the principles of people who have been so manipulated by the fear to not fit in. And that's all it is. My child is different. Therefore, I am now excluded in my community. So to avoid this, I'm throwing you out. There's something fundamentally wrong in your head. And you really should think about if you, if you should live, you know. Or For me, this is undeserving of life. Or a witch in a community in which they had to put them outside into the forest mm -hmm. to get away. And the witches said, you know, I'm not part of this community, yet everybody comes to me for advice. Right. Everybody right. comes to me for healing with herbs. The people, she's a doctor. The people who accused women of witchcraft, these were not witches. These were just women of great example in their communities of being healers, of being knowledgeable, of being guides and coaches, we would say today. And the people who put them on these fires and, and burn them down where their friends, their families. So don't get it wrong. Family will fall turn into, against you. Oh, they will turn if against you if their own security is at stake. Is at stake. Absolutely. And it hasn't changed today. I can't even say how often, at least five times a month, I'm going to hear a session like this. Well, this you is know? why we like marginalized people. Right. We always have. Yeah. That's my tribe. That's my tribe. So even, again, even if I meet all these trans people and, um, you know, they're sharing about their life, the one thing I don't try is to understand it. It's not my job to understand it. It's my job to be compassionate and to be supportive because mm -hmm. that's what I want. I don't need people to understand my life. I want them only to respect me and to have some compassion and to have an understanding. And to support. have their own dignity and Absolutely. to live their dignity, to Absolutely. live their honor in their life. You see, and once and once the the LGBT and trans dignity and respect kicks in correctly, as it should be, it's going to be very transformative and the third wave will be very instrumental to it because they're not going to take anything of that crap. Now, I think we have to talk about how do people lose connection to their oversoul? Because we have massive amounts of people who lose it. Fear, sin, shame, guilt. The great cancers of our society. You know, be who you are and you're going to be alone. Or when they're That's overwhelmed. That's what my mother used to say. You know, you, if you're different, you're going to be lonely. Well, people get overwhelmed. You know, first of all, he's having an affair with another woman. And then there's the daughter who needs attention. And then, you know, there's a narcissistic parent or whatever. One of the parents that's difficult. And you said people get overwhelmed. Right. in their lives, and that is why they lose yeah. complete connection to Absolutely. their oversoul. It gets too much. It is like, you know, a problem becomes a domino a stone, and then before you know it, it has um, a, a, a boomerang effect around you, and when you are surrounded by, you know, so many negativities around you, yes, what it disconnects is your inner alignment with your oversoul. And that's when we have nervous breakdowns, and that's when we have psychotic episodes, that's when we have, um, um, uh, you know, We talk here about even. different dimensions and their connection to mental illnesses, mm -hmm. specifically bipolar conditions and everything. Right. Do you want to say anything about that? Because I'm, I'm grasping it, the whole concept of mm -hmm. mentally ill people and dimensions. The thing is, what we call mentally ill, and I don't mean people who are severely damaged because that's a, you know, like, damage, when we say, no, we, when, we say, when we say schizophrenia, schizo real schizophrenia, Very I cool. think there's like five cases in the world, real schizophrenic. Um, there are people, when we see someone yelling and screaming in the street, usually they're homeless, but, you know, quite often they're normal people who just are in between dimensions. They yell at someone, they scream at someone, they get upset, they have a whole dialogue. We watch it and think, probably drunk or crazy. But what they are is they are in an in-between state of this dimension and another dimension. And somewhere in there, they have a dialogue with somebody. So mental illness is a 
for me is often a state of a, 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 a spirit being trapped trapped between two dimensions and can't identify which one do I want to be in now. And then what does the medication do? Well, the medication usually just encapsulates, uh, cages the problem, and so no other response can happen. So it keeps it basically locked in a, in a box, and let's try everything possible to keep that state locked in a box. But what we know is in... in um, in, uh, you know, that's why we have exorcisms, that's why we have voodoo rituals, that's why we have these psycho, psychodramatic ritual effects. Mm. But if people are medicated to up to the bazoo, then the ritual can have no effect uh, on that idea. In the end of the day, you know, and it sounds very simple if I say it, but it's really about what you believe. Mm. Your belief dictates your state of dimensional experience. So people have to learn inner work to change their beliefs. Yeah. Inner work to change their habits. Yeah. Habits are always very yeah. connected to beliefs. Absolutely. A problem is a habit. Yes. There's nothing else but a habit. Every problem is. You know, every addiction is a habit. So and the habit overrides the connection to the oversoul. So what is a fully awakened spirit or human being is a fully connected to the oversoul um, uh, mind if you want. And you have to do an internal work in which you look at yourself and you see what your addictions are, what your shadows are. You've got to be honest with yourself. Very honest. Who am I? Because whatever I think I am and believe, especially I believe I am, that's what you're going to get nourished by the universe more and more and more. And then if you don't like it, then you should think about why am I holding on to this kind of belief? And we talked about, you know, we do a ritual called the mm -hmm. shadow binding ritual mm -hmm. in which we balance the shadow by binding certain elements right. of it. And we do right. that in a temple in Mexico and it's right. very involved. Yes. But it's profound. Yeah. And yeah. I think that, that the world because is looking for that kind of exorcism or Lilith well, doing the exorcism. The thing, is that the thing is, to be technically correct, is it's not that we destroy the shadow. We just balance too much of it. Mm -hmm. It's like alkaline and acidity. You know, all these people run around, be alkaline, be alkaline. If you're alkaline, you die. You know, don't be stupid. You need a healthy balance of alkaline and um, acidity. The same with light and shadow. There should be a balance. Like the um, hermetic law says, if um, uh, the law of polarity, there has to be light and there has to be dark. If you're only light, you know, you can become as much of an egomaniac, which there are a lot, by the way, you know, I'm great, I'm the best. And then the same with darkness, of course. So it has the same effect, no matter how unbalanced you are. So in the system that I, that I use, um, or that, that, uh, that astro form that we use, is we try to remove the unnecessary, the, um, the unnecessary amount of shadow and keep the rest to keep a balance in our system. We do not destroy our shadow, that would be... Which is a profound great. ritual, anyway. It is. Something we do only in trainings. Only in trainings, yes. Only for we certain don't. people. Yeah. We usually do a training for 100 people and then we stop. Not even, but you know, it's that's usually the idea. People. It but that happens. is the idea. I mean, whoever shows up to the process shows up and is there and yes. meant to get it. You know, but we live in very interesting times, I think. Very interesting times. Um, to I stay do, connected to the oversoul. Mm -hmm. This is very important in your life. I think that is the next step of understanding what the oversoul is and what kind of power is even in the oversoul, which is all power is there. But also that you are not existing just as a piece of flesh with a name and a birth mm -hmm. date here in one dimension and good luck to you. We are existing on multi-dimensional levels of experience. Um, and we interact and connect with these experiences. And therefore, sometimes we call these experiences past lives. Yes. That's all it is. Now, you often talk about Norea, who was the wife of Noah, Noah. and that set fire to the who's ark. Who's the daughter of Eve. Who's the daughter of Eve. Right. Whom he didn't want on the ark because Eve, for them, is sinful. Right. It's the race of evil. Right. Like Moses taking all the Jews to the desert in order for them to forget over a whole generation. Yeah, that, you know, everything that happened. You have to be, absolutely, you have to be just family. smart. Why would a man who convinces, let's say 150,000 people, to wander through a, 
area geographically a, a time only of two weeks were needed to cross mm -hmm. that part okay and runs around in circles and says I think I'm lost okay because he wanted to make sure if you really read between the lines he wanted to make sure that the generation who finally enters the holy land has no reference anymore to the old gods, to the old religions, to the old traditions. Only Yahweh. Only Yahweh. I will create a society only who obeys Same you. Same the Christians. Because, same idea. Same idea. Because even, um, even he himself, Moses, is not allowed to go into the old land, into the new land, because he belongs to the old Egyptian, Egyptian tradition. Because he knows. So even God says, not you. Okay, so thanks for all these sheep, but not you, because you could t turn on me, like Adam and Eve and Lilith and all the others, and tell them about what existed before. And this is the idea of a flood. Let's just get rid of the Nephilim. Right. Let's take out racial memory. Right. Let's make sure no one remembers Atlantis or any of these places, mm -hmm. either. You mm -hmm. know, that's also mm -hmm. flooding. Mm -hmm. Let's destroy anybody who has Nephilim blood. Right. That has been going on for centuries. And didn't work. It didn't work because it didn't work. It still comes from the underground. Because Norea says to Noah the first time, let me in. And he says, not you and your kind. <laughs> so she burns the thing down. So he's forced to build a second ark. And she says, okay, can I come in now? And he says, absolutely not. Not you and your mother. <laughs> so she burns the second ark. By the third, she says, screw you, I'm out of here. So he builds the third. But th by that time, I'm convinced she informs the Nephilim and says, you better watch out because, you know, that crazy guy up there is going to flood the whole place. I'm just saying it in very, um, in very Marvel um, and mm -hmm. uh, terms. DC terms, okay? Uh, imagine this is a Marvel movie. But she says, no, you better watch because when Noah, at the end of the, law of the 40 days of rain and, and, um, and flooding, he arrives somewhere, they all come out and said, oh, no, look. Nephilim survived. Ten percent of them made it. You know, read your Bibles. Um, and Thank that goodness. and that means that the Nephilim uh, created places of knowledge and empowerment, and some created be, because of that something that we call shamanism. Shamanism comes out of the necessity not to forget the innate power that we have in our systems. Born in nature. nature. In, in nature. nature. We are part of nature, and nature heals nature, so the one can't go without the other, right? We've talked many times about Atlantis mm -hmm. and the medicine wheel. Mm -hmm. That's quite a fascinating thing, that yeah. a lot of the structures of Atlantis are built into the Native American well, just look at wheel. it. Look at it. If you look at it from an aerial point, if I had a drone, hint, hint, mm -hmm. uh, if I had a drone, um, I would see similar concentric circles and similar concentric ideas the way Atlantis was described, and who tells me not that there is a correlation in uh, sacred imagery to the clans, to the to clans, many in the tribes? In Absolutely, Native yes, of course. Traditions. Of course, go back. We speak a lot about this, much more into detail about my findings and my research in the trainings. This really we don't really expose too much about because taken out of context, it just confuses people. Or you know, I get the, you know, I would I get the comments of but I read something else, and I'm not interested in that. No. So this is just something that we it's wanted to... It's a mystery to, school. Yeah. It's a mystery school. We just wanted to... And again, it's not about you have to believe me. No. I, I want Do you, your research. Do your research. Now continue. Read. Find. Research. Read again. Find again. Question it. You know, this is, this is how you stay connected and enlightened. I'm a mm -hmm. firm believer in the medicine wheel. Yes. I have lived it all my life. That is what I found. Yeah. And it became really my guide all my life, yeah. building the medicine wheels, activating them, working with them. Um, you learn everything about life mm -hmm. and the balance of life and how to enter the universe and how to live multidimensionally. It's quite an extraordinary thing. Absolutely. If you ever want to learn about it, yeah, I have a Vimeo only on the medicine wheel, everything I learned. Right. Which we is 150 have, pages of just, medicine wheel. <laughs> you just said the keyword, please share, like, and subscribe. Please share, like, and subscribe. I'm so pathetic. But please do so, so that we can continue with this. You know, again, we are not very regular. And I hope you forgive us. In the, in you know, um, because 
we we tried, but this <laughs> tour specifically was grueling for me, yeah, and well, it took a lot, a lot of energy, and a lot of time. But a lot of you, you know. You've been very generous and very kind with us and very understanding. But we wanted to do this for you guys because Foster, I'm going to see him now for the last time. Um, for two weeks. For two weeks. Because he's going to Poland and I'm going We're to Germany. all these things. Absolutely. And I'm going to um, Slovenia and to Germany first and to Slovenia next where I finish. And I'll bring you all that material. So you better show up because I'm not going to do it again. Because you never keep the knowledge just for yourself. You have to share it. You have to share and that's you how have it to comes share. alive. Yes, you that's have to how share. it keeps. That's what we do. Renewing us. That's our and main job is sharing. Then it's teaching. Then it's God knows what. But you know, that's the idea. Okay, guys, we kept it uh, at one hour. Yay! And we will be in Las Yay. Vegas <laughs> all summer, all summer, dying of the heat or something else. <laughs> but um, but many people will come there to see us. Absolutely, so it's quite we're going to be. Time. We're going to be there. It's also our April. birthday is coming. The anniversary of us. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a time coming. Yeah. In other words, we're going to be drunk a lot. No. <laughs> not, not me. <laughs> Probably we're going to be on the sofa, you know, like two hippos. <laughs> but happy hippos. We will be celebrating life. Absolutely. And the medicine and wheel. We want to celebrate you guys. Celebrate this is what you. this podcast is about. We want to celebrate you, um, our connection with you, um, whatever made this possible and whatever orchestrated the, these paths and ways. And weave this fantastic net. Thank you, Lilith. We all meet. Thank you, Lilith. Lilith and every every person who sacrificed lady. their life and their uh, experience um, for us to have this experience, right? Yes. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. We see you next time. Ciao. I probably will Ciao. make my own little <laughs> in between my little uh, takes. So look, we at are me. so grateful. Be grateful. Say yes to life. Say yes. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, bye.